Hey! Woo! 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 This tour looks at Patrick Beaton's fifth book on Steve Hope, The Silence. As the title suggests, it opens up conversations that many find hard about like our mental health, anxiety, lead them when you're not okay. We've been overwhelmed with the messages, the emails, all of it about how this book has helped people, how it's changed people's lives, and how it's made them think differently about mental health and Christianity in the Pete Gray says this. Tonight, tonight, um, this is the last night of the uh, eight arms uh, being signed events. Um, so this is the last night of the eight arms being signed And, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen um, after this weekend. Um, we're just really glad that we've got to the end tour and that, uh, you know, we didn't have to cancel anything and that we've had. It's been an absolute joy for me to have this young lady on the tour playing violin with me. We never met um, until the first night um, of the, the Oz tour uh, last week. And uh, <clears throat> she's really very special. I want to take her home with me and have her play violin with me every time I'm <laughs> singing. Classical background, you hit him in when, uh, school of music is very prestigious. Um, only select few young musicians get to go there. Um, and of course, I've got very non classical background, and uh, you've got that whole Celtic thing going on. But I discovered um, about the third night of the tour that um, Natasha actually. Kind of got this little thing, Celtic thing in there that you know, she really, she really wants to have a go at it. So she's learned, um, is it a jig or a ring? I think it's a jig. Um, and it's, uh, it's called Drowsy Maggie. So we thought, just as a kind of you know, fun way to start the evening off musically, that um, we'll play Drowsy Maggie. <laughs>
struggling in the in the edge of the sea one time and, and the bird was trying to, to get out of the water onto a rock and uh, she was like I kind of feel like that's me just every day is a challenge I've got three young kids I'm on my own now and my and uh, every day it's like just a battle with the waves of panic and anxiety and not being able to sleep at night. Um, so this is kind of her story. But but in it, you know, that the, the hope that was in her story is that she came through the storm and she's found a place and she can call home and uh, she's uh, she's in a much better place.
songs on lines, we had teams. He, um, he was a very gifted, talented, um, academic young guy with uh, dreams and, and so much really to live for. But he, uh, he got into drugs and he really struggled with that addiction for years. He, had, he went through some periods of rehab and uh, seemed to begin his life back on track. And during those times, we would we would have some great conversations. And, and he, I think, really in hindsight, he was probably just saying what he reckoned I wanted to hear. I don't think he was really opening up and being honest about how he felt. But then he would just go off the radar and, and didn't answer messages and couldn't get him on the phone. Um, we would know that he's kind of just gone back down into that dark place where he really didn't want to be. Um, and I, I used to say to him, like, just, just call, you know, because we actually, none of us, none of us can, can do this on our own.
But I really upset my daughter Kezia. Um, apparently, I was breathing too loudly. And, um, <laughs> that was really bad. And then the other day, I made the unforgivable sin. I asked her to empty the dishwasher. <laughs> to be fair, she had done it four months ago. And obviously, I put her under a lot of pressure. And, uh, but, you know, it's challenging. So, we thought what we really need is a good old family holiday. And uh, our little dog Georgie had puppies and we'd never been able to afford to go abroad before. So we thought, maybe this is our opportunity. So we decided to go to Egypt and uh, we were going to do all the touristy things. And I was quite nervous about taking the four kids together on a holiday. And, uh, and I remember uh, this photograph, actually, I've just taken this photograph and I'm standing in a crowd of 15 people. And Caleb, my seven-year-old, quickly shouts out at the top of his voice, Dad, whatever you do, don't get on that camel. And I'm like, why, son? It might never be able to get up ever again. <laughs> And everyone was loving this, by the way, you know, they thought this is the funniest thing. But one of the reasons we chose Egypt is because I've always had this dream of swimming with dolphins. Anyone here ever swam with a dolphin? Um, a couple of people. And I always thought it was going to be this beautiful, magical, wonderful experience. Because when I was, who remembers the film Flipper? Remember Flipper? Flipper is flipping brilliant. That's what Flipper is. I'm drowning with dolphins at this point. 
And, uh, and then I thought, there is nothing for it, I'm going to have to ask for help. And uh, so at the top of my voice, I went, help! <laughs> and with that, Aquaman flung me the ring of shame. <laughs> I picked up the ring of shame, I grabbed it, and next to me on the ring of shame was my son Daniel. Would you believe it? And he went, all right, Dad. <laughs> and then he went, swimming with dolphins is uh, pretty stressful, isn't it? And I went, shut up, shut up, shut up, come bring, come bring, come bring. Aquaman, who was pulling me in, the instructor, i never forget, he said, breathe. It's going to be all right. It's pretty tough out there, isn't it? Let me carry you back to the boat. And I got back to the boat, I'm not going to lie, I ran to the toilet, um, it wasn't pleasant, it was coming out of both ends. And I sat on the toilet and I thought a number of things. Number one, dolphins are arrogant. <laughs> number two, is I'm going to do talk and anxiety soon, that's ironic. And three is one day I'm going to get this into a sermon. And, you know, the thing is, I had this beautiful idea of what swimming with dolphins was going to be like, and it just didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. I've also had an idea in my life how I think life should turn out for me, and the reality is it doesn't always turn out the way you think it should. Who here can relate to, please put your hand up if this relates to your life, that's all, just a little bit, there must be more than just me in the room. Um, for those of you watching, that's pretty much everyone in the room. And you know, so often we have a plan, don't we? And it doesn't work out. I mean, just look at what's going on across the country. Who would have thought of this six months ago? It's impacted people's lives in such, uh, in such a heartbreaking way. You just can't always plan life. That is the reality. And, uh, but I was reflecting on this little story. And I was thinking, what did I learn about um, this story? Um, number one was, why did I refuse the life jacket? And the reason I refused the life jacket was my pride. Because I didn't want people to know that I was a rubbish swimmer. I wanted to be a good dad, strong dad, like all the other dads, and all the other mums there. And uh, that's what stopped me doing it. You know what, I can tell people about the stuff that I'm struggling with, with mental health, for exactly the same reason. I didn't want to appear of being the weak dad, the dad that couldn't cope, the dad that was struggling with anxiety. And uh, so I kept it all inside. And when people asked me, I did that classic thing we do, particularly in church on Sunday, when people say, how are you doing? What do you say? <laughs> you know, the other thing that I thought, why did it take so long to ask for help? I was actually drowning. And I think it's because I live by the shoots of the must I ought. I should be a strong swimmer. I ought to be able to cope. And again, when I go through a tough time, I start to live by the shoots of the must I ought. I should be able to cope. I must pull myself together. I ought to get stronger. How many times have you used the words, I should, I must, I ought? We do it all the time, don't we? Particularly at times like this. Um, and you know, how are we meant to be reacting? And sometimes on your worst days, I got myself in such a situation, I thought, you know what, I, I think everyone would be better off if I wasn't here because I'm bringing the whole team down. And yeah, you know, people will be sad, hopefully, um, but just for a little bit. And they'll get over it and they'll be better off in the long run. That's just what a desperate, lonely place to be. And, uh, but that was the place that I found myself in. Aquaman, the instructor, he was not what I was expecting. I was expecting him to go, you stupid white boy, you long, you come over here, you think you can swim, didn't take a life jacket, what an idiot. He said this, it's pretty tough out there, breathe, you're going to be all right. Hang on in there. Let me carry you. And you know, when I struggle with my anxiety, when I struggle with my mental health, I actually feel God says a very similar thing. It's tough. Life is tough. It's tough for a lot of people at the moment in our country. It's tough for some of you guys watching online. It's tough for some of us here. And, uh, and yet God doesn't sort of whack us. It's like, it's tough. Hang in there. It's going to be all right. Grab hold of this thing and let me carry you back to the safe place. And you know, so often we have a different view of God, and sometimes I think he's like an angry school teacher. But the reality is, he's not like that. You know, um, my story is a typical story, really, of a Christian worker who was um, so busy and um, working. Uh, I worked so hard, and a job I was so passionate about. And I'd be one of those things, I'd work so hard, and then I'd burn out, and then I'd work really, really hard again. 
Right, burn out, rest, work really hard, burn out, rest. It's a little bit like, if you take your phone, your phone works as well on 10% as it does 100%. Think about that. There is nothing that your phone can't do on 10% that it can do on 100%. It just doesn't last very long. And some of us have got habits of doing that constantly, burning out time and time again, resting, then burning out again, resting, and then burning out again. We have got to get a different way of doing it. But the thing for me is the showreel always looked really, really good. And uh, I remember a number of years ago now that the charity that I was running had a visit from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I hope you caught those names as they dropped. <laughs> and uh, we were really excited. This is a photograph of, um, of uh, my wife and the Duke and the Duchess. Uh, my wife's the one on the end of blonde hair. <laughs> And, uh, and it's quite amusing actually, just before this happened, um, the Duchess um, turned to Diane and said, do you like my dress? I'm not really sure what you meant to say when the Duchess of Cambridge says, do you like my dress? And uh, Diane was like, yeah, it's a very nice dress. And she went, that's good. William says, I look like a tablecloth. <laughs> saying goodbye to Catherine on the steps of All Hallows London Wall, which is the church that I was in charge of at the time. And what you can't see in that photograph, that in front of us there are literally hundreds and hundreds of people, but they've all got cameras, and they've all taken our photograph. And so in this photograph, I am turning to Catherine, and I'm going, I haven't got a clue how to do this. This is intense. And so uh, that night, I was on the 6 o'clock news, and these photos literally went around the world. I was in OK Magazine. <laughs> Thank you. Hello Magazine. Magazines of Sweden I've never heard of. <laughs> and you know, everyone was texting me going, wow, Patrick, you're doing really well, right? Uh, the reality is, is that in this photo, I'm really struggling with anxiety. And just to go through a dark time of depression. And it was nothing to do with the royals coming. I was waiting for a really um, very serious operation on my legs. I was anxious. Um, I'd been through it once. I was going to have to go through it again. The first time I had it, it nearly just, uh, just changed my life so much in my family's life. And I was really, really struggling. I felt really broken. I felt like I just couldn't cope. And yet I was living with this, I should, I must, I all. Try and pull yourself together. And when I started to feel this anxiety, and I started to talk about it with people, um, particularly when I mentioned it to a couple of people in church, um, it was really hard because I'd go up to people going, I think I'm struggling with anxiety. And I remember this one guy saying to me, if you're struggling with anxiety, you know what you need to do? Trust God a bit more. I was like, thanks, I never thought of that, that's really helpful. <laughs> and, um, or someone else said to me, um, well, have you got a secret sin in your life that you need to say sorry for? And so what I did is I thought of every sin that I've ever done in my life, ever. Um, in fact, I made some sins up just to be sure. And, uh, you know, because I didn't want this to happen. Some people said, Patrick, just got to have more faith. And the reality was, I just felt broken. And, uh, and sometimes when you hear these sort of attitudes, and, and unfortunately some of them are coming out even now, you know, you start to think, hang on a minute, we've got to be a bit more real. And I came to the place, and I'm still at that place, I'm a bit fed up with the show from this. I'm a bit fed up of not being authentic. I'm longing for integrity, I'm longing for people just to be real, for people to realise that it's okay not to be okay. And that we're actually, when you show up and you truly see that people love you for who you are, that's real relationship and that's real friendship. So what I did is when I go through a tough time, I tend to write books. It saves on the therapy bills. And uh, I start getting all this stuff down, I start grappling with all these different things. And I wrote this book, honestly, over silence. And, uh, and there were times when I was writing it, I was thinking, you know what, maybe I should stop now. This is really important, this is really honest. And uh, there's one point I did put my, uh, uh, my laptop down. And uh, but at that point, I was studying the Psalms. And I realised that 40% of the Psalms are the men's. Then David crying out to God, 
I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. But you know what? I'm going to trust in you anyway. If there isn't a message for our time, that isn't that. I don't know what it is. I don't get it. I don't understand. What, why these things? I don't. But you know what? Despite everything, God, I'm going to trust in you anyway. Because I know that you are here. And, uh, and I realise that some of the most beautiful poetry, the most beautiful art, the most beautiful music, the most beautiful films have been done in times of the men where people have just got real and honest. And, and I realise that this is what God was asking me to do. But I didn't just want to write about uh, my story. I thought in the book, let me get some other people to write their stories. Uh, people that I describe as real heroes. And this lovely lady is called Rachel Wright. Um, Rachel has a son with a life limiting condition. He has 20 injections a day. He's turned every two hours. And I remember her talking to me about it. And I've been around her house and seeing just the way that she's to care for her son. And uh, she was saying, you know what, it's hard. Because sometimes, you know, when we talk about suffering, we talk about seasons. She says, next season is my son dies. So I'm saying this season is not this okay. But she said, without my faith, I can get up in the mornings because I know that God is with me. The next uh, chapter was written by a really good mate of mine, John Sutherland. He was a borough commander and he basically had 1,500 police officers that worked for him. He was a real tough guy. And, uh, and many years ago now, he was down at AE. And I just assumed wrongly that maybe. Um, you know, he'd been stabbed, he'd been shot, he'd been involved in some sort of violence. And what happened was, is life had just got too much. He had a breakdown. And I remember going to visit him, I went once a week, um, for a few months afterwards, and I sort of realised that people struggle with mental health, they don't want to be fixed, they just want to be loved and listened to. And, uh, and I said, mate, what's going on? And he went, you know, Patrick, the whole man up thing hasn't worked out very well for me, has it? And I think for a lot of blokes, it hasn't worked out very well for us. And uh, then the next one, uh, the next chapter was by a beautiful uh, friends of mine, Alan and Jackie Slough. A really tender chapter, but written so beautifully. Um, they tell the story of their 16-year-old son who completed a suicide. And I was like, uh, are you sure you want to write this? Are you sure you want to be in this book and on the DVD and all that sort of stuff? And they were like, you know what, six and a half thousand people complete suicides in this country every single year, every single day on our roadways. Um, not talking about stuff isn't working out very well for us. And uh, we've got to talk about it. The research professor from the States, Premier Brown, says we are living in the most medicated, addicted, obese cohort in the whole of history. We need to start having a more honest conversation. And so the first part of the book was all the things I believed that I needed to let go of. I needed to let go of the pretend smile. I needed to let go of anxiety. And in the second half, we're going to unpack how anxiety feels and how we can help ourselves with anxiety, which is particularly relevant um, in today's society. Someone said this, it's not sex that sells, it's fear. Letting go of the clock, letting go of stigma, letting go of pain, letting go of perfectionism. There was this one image that really helped me out so much. Um, it's the image of Kim Sugi. If you get a bowl and you break it, I guess what we would normally do is we'd make it a super glue. And the whole idea of super glue is we try and hide the cracks, we try and pretend it's not broken. What they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. There isn't a bowl like that on planet Earth. There's no one like you on planet Earth. Our scars are not there to be ashamed of. Our scars are places of healing. You are unique. Your story, your history, your emotions, your memories, who you are. We need you here tonight and those watching online to be more you. Because that's who God made you. We need you to flourish in who you are. So anyway, me and my friend Hannah, um, you know what? We decided to have a go at doing this whole Kintsugi thing. And uh, this is what happened. Check this out.
feel like that that time. I was in a bubble and feeling alone and not even knowing how to articulate that to anyone. I had to have a major limb reconstruction surgery. Around the same time, my daughter got a condition called HSP, and my dad got cancer. It was like the perfect storm of things going wrong. And I realised that the anxiety was really taking root in my life. And then you realise that actually you can't just carry on. And you need to show them some self-compassion. Bereavement is different for everyone. What's really important is that people are able to talk to someone that they can connect with. And through that, there's a real good healing process. And actually, maybe receiving help is letting go of your pride and saying, I am really broken. And as we share in our brokenness, we share in our common humanity. The brokenness is my heart, it's in pieces. But through time, it's starting to come together again. I love that I'm saying discovering treasure in life's scars. And uh, that means so much to us in Kintsugi Hope. I'm my friend, uh, Catherine, and uh, she's an acoustic artist. And what she's done for us is she's made us some things to give to people that are going through a tough time. She realises, as we all do, that when someone's going through a tough time, they don't really want sympathy cards. It's a bit bad for isn't it? Um, so she made this acoustic jewellery and, uh, and she has this beautiful quote that says it's the scars of our lives are not to be hidden for they make us who we are. And uh, we literally can't get these made um, big enough because every single one um, she's made by hand, bespoke. It's really hard to get anything these days that's bespoke, made by hand. And, and we have a few of these earrings here that may be a lovely gift for someone you know who's going through a really, really tough time and you can check those out at break. I realised for me, my biggest issue was, if I'm really honest with you, and I sort of have to be because I've written a book about the other songs, um, was about shame. And I realised there's a big difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I've done something wrong, and uh, you know, people, I used to have a lot of people that work for me, and I, when they were late every single morning, I actually liked them to feel guilty. <laughs> I just get up early and get on the early train, and uh, you are letting the team down a little bit. But actually, shame and guilt are so different. Shame is, I believe, that somehow I am wrong. Brain and grounds are strange as two voices. Who do you think you are and you're not enough? Shame loves silence, secrecy, and judgment. It keeps things hidden. But the thing about shame is it can't stand being spoken about. It can't stand empathy. And so somehow we've got to step out of shame and we need to own our story. And as me and my wife died, we were praying about this, and I was running, I guess, what perceived as a quite successful charity, the Royals had just been, and we had lots of connections with very well known politicians, and I don't want to mention their name, but one has mom there, he doesn't quote me very often. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking this is all going very well, the media are doing stuff, and the charity that I was running got to 21 years old, and I felt God say, time to let it go. And I was like, what? I'm a founder, we don't let go. No, I'm not breaking your heart for something else. And I'll never forget it. I went, God, you know what? I will do anything for you apart from one another charity. Because I never want to fundraise ever again in my life. And, uh, and I felt God say, genuinely felt God say, don't put charity in movement. And so I studied movements. I looked at movements. I looked at park run. Anyone heard of park run? Put your hand up if you've heard of park run. Put your hand up if you've ever done park run. Wow, that's quite impressive. Very good, very good. Very good. Uh, for those of you who don't know about park run, park run is when people run together in parks. And uh, it's brilliant. It happens all over the country. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people, you belong, but you don't have to fit in. It's incredible. I looked at rock choir. Um, who's heard of rock choir? Anyone heard of rock choir? Choir start all across this country. It's fantastic in community halls and schools and different places. And again, you belong but you don't have to fit in. Different cultures, different ages, different abilities come together in the grassroots of community. And we watchers, anyone done we watchers? No, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. Um, I joined we watchers and I know it's hard to leave, but um, the woman said to me, um, you know what? We don't really talk about um, uh, weight too much now in terms of food. We talk about gratitude and all or nothing thinking. Well, it's brilliant, I can be in church, this is fantastic. And um, we looked at Alcoholics Anonymous, this incredible 
health step program that has gone around the world, helping so many people get freedom. And meantime, we started to pray. And you know they say this, they say vision is the art of seeing the invisible that reduces passion and energy in people. That's why um, Jim Wallace says Martin Luther King never stood up in front of a quarter of a million people in Washington and went, I've got a complaint to make. <laughs> or I've got a really interesting three year plan and I'm going to have an AGM and we're going to discuss it and you can ask me all the difficult questions. <laughs> he said, I've got a dream. I've got a dream of justice and equality. And you've only been behind the dream. And so I was like, God, that's really good. But just keep the dream small. Um, that would be brilliant. So we started to pray. We really felt God laid on our hearts to see a world <laughs> where mental and emotional health is understood and accepted with safe and supported communities for everyone to grow and flourish. And it wasn't just like a clever old words I chucked up on the screen. I don't consult with saying I have to do it. But you know what? I realised that when you feel accepted and really understood by someone, and you feel safe and supported, guess what? You will grow and you will flourish. And uh, that's just the reality. Hello. I nearly went there. <laughs> and uh, that is the reality. So we thought, how on earth can we get this around the country? So what me and my wife and I did is we wrote a 12-step program to do with wellbeing. Not particularly complicated. We looked at all the issues to do with wellbeing, like anger and forgiveness and stigma and shame and anxiety and depression and <coughs> resilience, uh, self-acceptance. And, uh, and in some ways, I thought it was quite clever because we wrote it in learning styles. So for each topic, um, we came up with seven different learning styles um, because we all learn differently. Uh, some of us are very creative, why right? not? Some of us like to discuss things, others like don't. So we want to see all these different learning styles. We have four different activities under every single learning style for every single subject. And then we thought, you know, we're a little bit tired. We don't really want to start a massive charity. And then I thought, I tell you what, all the churches I know, I've been speaking to churches for years, most of them have small groups. They have like home groups or life groups or, or groups that work with mums and tots or groups that work with the homeless or groups that do food bank or cab or, or the other amazing things. So why don't we just say, why don't you run this for 12 weeks? And, uh, and, you know, and see how you get on. But don't just run it for you, run it for people in your community. And I remember sitting down on my life group and going, well, maybe we should do this. And, uh, and I don't know what, sometimes with my groups, I feel like, you know, we've been stuck in the book of Hebrews now for two years. <laughs> we can do a change. Oh, it's fantastic to see it is. And uh, so we were like, we'll go for it. And so what we did, is we weren't just going to go for it for us, is we were going to go for it and invite people in our community. And I remember me and Diane going up to people in our community going, um, you know, we started at the kids' playground, the school playground. And um, we're going to start a Kintsugi Hope Wellbeing Group. Would you like to come? And everyone was like, what? And, uh, and then we described what this Japanese word it means, gold jewelry and, and all that sort of stuff. And it means beauty comes out brokenness. And I remember people's reaction was incredible. Oh yeah, that's good, that. I think I've heard of the gold thing. Yeah, I've heard of the gold thing. And then they go, yeah, oh, I might come and say, mate, I'm pretty broken. My husband's just left. I'm in debt up to my house. Um, Yeah, I've come. My kids, um, I know, got mental health challenges, my kids are going through anxiety and it's starting to affect me. Yeah, I've come. Never told me about this before, but I've self harmed for 35 years. All this stuff started to come out. I come, my marriage broke down a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm just lonely and I'm struggling. I've got no one to talk to. And these are people that lived in our community. And so I was there on the first week, and our life group had trebled in size. And I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest with you. It's not like we dragged people off the street or anything. I mean, everyone knew someone. And uh, but I sat next to a gentleman who was just, he was just an amazing guy, and I sort of known him my whole life, you know, been connected to the same church roughly for 45 years. And I remember turning to him, and my mind did this little exercise of turn to the person beside you and talk about a high point in your life and a low point in your life. And, uh, and he started to talk. And after five minutes, I felt quite emotional because I'd learned more in five minutes than I'd learned in 45 years of being in the same church as this guy. 
And I turned to him and I went, mate, I'm so sorry. How do we create a culture where that's okay? We're doing this every Sunday, and you're never going to back, I didn't know anything about it. And we went through it, um, and it's brilliant, and he's brilliant. And the whole 12 weeks, I learned so much. I learned much from people of faith and people of no faith. And I'm guessing there'll be people here tonight who are in both camps and people watching online as well. But the thing was, it wasn't about them and us, it was just about us as common human beings grappling with issues. And faith for me was important because it's part of my story. So we talked about stuff to do with faith and things to do with, um, with God. Of course we did, because it's important, it's part of people's story. But we went through the 12 weeks and it was brilliant. And then I was um, at a big festival doing a talk, and uh, I had the largest tent on site, it was a festival, and it was on anxiety, and it was so embarrassing, because um, we had to turn people away, because there weren't enough seats to get everyone in. I was like, what's it say about our country when, uh, like, you know, the biggest talk on site is on anxiety, and we got to, I felt so bad turning people away, they were so, you know, they had so much courage coming to this talk, and I was like, sorry, you can't come in. You know, I said to Mike, my friend, good job, it wasn't on rejection. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but the reality is, I said, anyone want a pilot? And the church, for all its faults, they're amazing, it's amazing. I remember, you know, one guy started in a homeless hostel. We had five homeless guys come every single week. I've shared this vision quite a few times now, as you can imagine. I had a guy in Cardiff say to me, do you realise the suicide rates in the farming community? And, um, it's incredible. So some of these farmers, they've literally worked for 30 years, they've had about um, two weeks off for 30 years. Um, church doesn't work for them, the time is all out, things are going on all the time. Can I run this in the farmer's market? I was like, that would be brilliant. And we had other people going, well, this would really work in prisons. We'd love to see this in prisons all across our country. So we're piloting it in a male prison, female prison, and a juvenile prison. Um, other people are like, well, we'd love to see it work for the deaf community. Because you know what, um, in the deaf community, we don't really talk about faith and mental health as much. And a lot of churches think, if you get a sign up, that's job done. But this would really work, because these are issues of what people are facing. Other people have gone, what we'd love to see in the army, or in the sports team, um, or the navy, um, with mums and tots on the week, coming together. And suddenly I started to think, maybe a movement might be able to start. And I have to be really honest with you, and I'm online here as well, so I'm going to get in real trouble now, um, is that I said to God, you know what, God, if the next big move in your spirit comes in some massive warehouse somewhere, across the pond, and there's some really famous person there, and there's an amazing band, and they're all full of session musicians, and we're going to hype it up, and the Christian TV channel's going to come along, and we're going to beam it across the world, and we're going to call it Revival, I think I might just quit. But you know what? If it could start in small groups, in hospitals, in prisons, and in the police, and in the army, and in the navy, and in schools, and in brothels, and in pubs, and in coffee shops, and in people's homes, with mums who are struggling to make ends meet, with the lonely and the isolated, I'm totally out for that. And you know, I think a movement could just begin and start to see a real difference. And I don't want it to be run by some charismatic person, but maybe by the fragile and the vulnerable and the humble and the courageous. Just maybe. So we started in two places. Crew and Chelmsford, where God lives. <laughs> Website and all the information is there as well. 
And uh, some people have said to me, Patrick, how on earth are you going to fund this thing? Which is a really good question. Because in some of my previous life, I think when you run a charity, it is really hard because what tends to happen is you get a government contract or you get a large amount of money from a grant making trust. Um, and then you run around for two years trying to replace that money that they're giving you. And, and normally the CEO um, has a nervous breakdown, can't sleep for about two years, and if you don't get money in, you lose half of your workforce. And I was like, do you know what, I'm running a wellbeing charity, that will not be good um, for me. And so I thought, let's go for a completely different strategy. Let's just try and get as many people as we can, give tiny amounts, £5 a month, £10 a month, £12 a month. And if we can get hundreds of people doing that, and it was a really gentle thing, because we don't want to take away from anything local, and we don't want anyone to give it, they can't afford it, but no, maybe we could get enough people to make this thing sustainable going forward. And, uh, and you know, to be honest with you, given the times that we live in, I was thinking last night, oh my goodness, these issues of that anxiety that we're going to unpack in the second half, is actually this may be more important than ever now. So if you wanted to help us, um, you are very, very welcome. Sometimes people say, why well, talk about money? And I'll tell you simply this, because we run a charity, and I'm not really sure what else I can do. I have tried kneeling by the front door, praying that money will come through the letterbox. <laughs> All that happens is the person looks to be really, really weird, and the book comes up and into my ear. Um, it's just as simple as that. So you can give them one of these, um, and inside there is a white form, if you wanted to give 5, 10, uh, 12 pound a month, um, just fill it in. If you haven't got all your bank account details, um, don't worry about it, we will hunt you down. <laughs> we'll give you a call in a week. Um, just fill that in and give it to me. And, uh, and if you're watching online, you can go to our website and you can give that way. And, uh, and you can do that online. But if you want uh, to do that, I would love to give you some gifts to say a genuine thank you. Um, because we really do want to be generous. We'd love to give you a copy of the Honesty Over Silence DVD. Um, this is tonight's talk on DVD. Um, I tend to use a lot of slides, I don't know if you noticed that. And a lot of people come up to me afterwards and go, um, can I get a copy of your slides? Or what some of you tend to do, when I'm not looking, you take pictures of them. I've seen some of you already do this in this room, and I don't mind. Um, you can take as many pictures as you want. But they're all on here, and uh, the other reason we did this is people often say to me, um, God, which last one was here? Or which one kids were here? Um, and so it's all on there because um, not everyone's into reading. And the next thing we'd love to give you is this journal. If we can have a few journal, anyone here journal? Um, there's a few people. Um, I actually think journaling is brilliant for your mental health. And, uh, but what I found is when I journal, I probably journal about five or six times a month, is I always went to my journal when I was feeling negative. And uh, so my journal was pretty depressing after a while. And so what I did when I designed this is on every other page, um, I came up with a positive quote, um, or a, a Bible verse, or something out of honesty and silence. So I'd love to give you one of those as well. I'd also love to give you um, this book, Conspiracy the Insignificant, and, uh, and this is my testimony book. This is how I came to faith and came to be doing a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now. And last but no means least, I'd love to give you a copy of Honesty Over Silence. And, uh, and I'll sign that for you, not because I'm signing, but just because I want to say thank you. Um, but equally, there is no pressure. But if you want to do that, give it to me in the break or afterwards. Um, that would be very, very welcome. And again, if you want to do it online, drop us an email and I'll make sure that we send all that stuff out to you. We'd really, really appreciate it. Um, when I started the charity, um, Kim Suzuki Hope, I said to my wife, um, one night I was in my wife's bedroom, it's my bedroom as well, and <laughs> I said to her, I don't know, I, this is scary, I feel like we were a boat being tossed around and, uh, on the seashore, and uh, who am I? You know, I struggle with all this stuff, I'm not one of these preachers who stand on stage and go, 30 years ago when I had anxiety, Anxiety is really life for me now. I think it's life for quite a few of us, right? And that's why we're going to have to unpack it in the second half. And, um, there's stuff, and I don't know if I want to do this. And, uh, and I remember one night, um, we were massive fans of Joanne and Iona, and uh, there's one to the album that Iona did back in the day called Beyond These Shores. And, uh, and it's just about uh, this monk called St. Brendan, who legend has it, he discovered 
uh, America before Columbus. And the imagery in the album is just beautiful. You have a sense, St. Brendan, we've made this level by, we've got 13 mates, and they're going to go out to sail. And he's looking at the sea, and it just looks dark and black. And it's like, what possibly is going to happen if I go? I'm compelled to go. I've got to share the gospel. We've got to go. And he goes. And there's a song called Beyond These Shores, and some of the lines is this. It says, if I sail to the furthest ocean, I'll lose myself in the depths below. Wherever I may go, your love surrounds me. Your love surrounds me. And I guess, as a country, um, we are facing a bit of an uncertain future over these next six to twelve months, wherever it will be. But the most beautiful thing, and I think this song is really prophetic in the sense that wherever we go, God's love surrounds us. Whatever happens, we cannot get away from the love of God. He is there and he is in silence. So Brendan had a special prayer, and I think it's beautiful where I have it on a little postcard on my desk. And it says these words I'm determined amongst all uncertainty always to trust. I choose to live beyond regret.
Um, we're now going to end at 10 and we like, so that time, you know, I'm going to come see for coffee. The stand will be open. Um, we do take cards if we buy the books and merch. These t shirts, by the way, <laughs> are half price. So, there you go. So go ahead and get that. Um, we do take cards. If you do want to support us, there's pens on the side. If you're watching online, we're going to be back at 10 past 8. The live stream will stay for this time. But go ahead and get a cup of tea, go to the toilet, or whatever you need to do. And we will catch you in 10 minutes. Take care. And we're back! Let's go. Thank you all again. Cup of tea, cup of coffee, a break. We're now going to um, we'll have the second half. In the second half, we're going to put off into anxiety. I'm going more deep into something. Um, we're talking to my death call. So if online, I'm looking at you guys, I'm like, you. If you think there's five people on your Facebook page or really good, um, help know about the ones that help unhack these kind of things. So please share it. First share. Send it around. Let's get some people on here. And everyone on, everyone here, once again, please keep your friends in there playing really because it would mean so much to me. Thank you. Um, as we go forward, as we move forward into this charity, we really realise we need people praying for us. We realise if God doesn't show up, there's no point us to so if you would love to pray for us, if you'd love to support us in that way, we're going to send you a clipboard out. And all that clipboard is, is you see by to your email address and tick in the box. That means we're then allowed to send you an email. We're going to send you a newsletter once a month. And that newsletter is basically going, okay, hey, this is what's going on in the life of the charity this month. This is what you can pray for if you pray for this. And alongside that, we'll send you a podcast. Me and Jess, once a month, do a podcast. Look at all the topics of well-being. So you will send that as well, just as a thank you and here's something you might want to watch. So if you do want to support us in that way, if you do want to pray for us, please move those name out with the clipboard that's going to go around. Start the second half, we're going to look at a video by Brené Brown. She's a research professor in the States. This video looks at the difference between sympathy and empathy in such a light-hearted way. It's better. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting, Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person, or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when we enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think that empathy is this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, huh? Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I have it, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as well. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face 
of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I know that you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. I really never thought I would actually play it um, in front of people. 
or to say it in a, in a, a room full of people. Uh, I just thought I'll record it and people can listen to it. Um, I don't have to say anything about it. But this is the honesty of the silence tour, so um, I decided after two nights of the tour that I should really be honest about the song and you know give you the context for it. Um, I am um, I consider myself not not particularly a worrier. I don't worry much about health and uh, you know the safety of my young sons. You know, with their dangerous activities, they do. But I get anxious and worry about other things that really, <clears throat> you know, I can't really do very much about. Like, you know, the choices I make, the sense of responsibility I feel, you know, that they make good choices. And also that this environment, you know, in camp where you feel totally overwhelmed. Um, and you kind of feel that there's, there's so little you can do. Um, and come, you come back from that environment and the, 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 the overwhelmingness of it just hits you. Um, and so this song is just was kind of my response to, you know, some of those things. Um, there's a scripture that says, um, where, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy in, I will give you rest. So, that's my rest. Smoke in the cave. 
Well, what's an amazing? Uh, I can't recommend enough Joanne's CDs high enough. Um, let's give them both another massive round of applause. Um, this is the last night I've toured, and uh, it's been quite a team effort, as you can possibly imagine. Um, uh, Natasha, a friend of mine, she's actually my goddaughter, so she has to play. Um, she has no choice. And, uh, and also at the back there, we've got Mike, who's organised the tour. Um, he's driven over a thousand miles in the last couple of weeks, and um, taken us around the country, and has worked incredibly hard. Um, and Joel and Jess, also at the back, Jess is my PA. And uh, Joel, we've also met, he's the um, teenager that leads lots of prayer. And, uh, boy. And, uh, and I'm sure we've got Alex and Ludamine and Diane as well, I'm probably watching at home. So that's our little Kintsugi team, and uh, we feel very, very honoured to be here with you this evening. Um, I guess trying to think through what to say tonight, and just looking at some of the key issues at the moment. I feel like one of the key issues where it's come to the coronavirus has obviously there's been lots of things around um, hand washing and uh, hygiene, lots of stuff about communion and, and all, all this sort of stuff, and it's all you know really important stuff. But I think one of the key issues that we really need to talk about is is anxiety and uh, how do we keep going? How do we keep our well-being? How do we look out for each other in this area? How do we? Um, as a country at this point, let's not do the stiff upper lip thing and just suppress things, but let's try and work a way that actually we can use this opportunity. And it's really interesting that when we uh, did the Kintsugi course, we did a week on resilience. And I uh, know someone said that the future doesn't belong to the brilliant, but it belongs to the resilient. And resilience, by definition, is this, thriving in the midst of adversity. And there was a fascinating piece of research which was done by Harvard, and, uh, and it was around surviving concentration camps. And not a lot of uh, at all saying that this is a situation like concentration camps at all. But the, the, the research was fascinating because it looked at everyone that survived. And there were four key things about the survivors. Number one was they accepted the reality that they were in. It was really interesting that the research showed that the optimists actually didn't last very long. Interesting. But the people going, you know, it'll be all right. We'll be out of here next week, um, we'll be out of here in a couple of months. They, the people that did well were those that accepted reality because acceptance and resignation are two really different things. Resignation is I quit, I don't know if I can't do it, I'm just in a cave. Acceptance is that I realise that I'm going to have to adapt, that things are going to have to change, that I'm going to have to work a way through this. And the second key thing was the people that did well, they found meaning and purpose um, and, and a deeper belief in what they were going through. The third characteristic was contentment. There's that classic verse, isn't it, in Paul with Philippians, I have learned to be content in all things. You notice it doesn't say in the book of Philippians, I am content. It, I've learned contentment. It's a process that you go through. And then the fourth thing, and for me this is the most important thing, is it made people um, really look at values i.e. what is really important in life. It's not just what you do, it's how you do it. It's the journey as well as the destination. And I believe, and I pray like mad, in this country over these next time, we're going to rediscover what caring for each other looks like. We're going to rediscover community. We're going to rediscover that actually the most important thing isn't the size of our house or our bank balance, as important as those things are, and I know they have an effect, but the most important things are human beings and people. How we love, how we care. You know, it's so often in our history that we have been very good in the church at communicating what we're against. We're against this and we're against that. Wouldn't it be amazing that this part of our history, that everyone in the UK and everyone in the world would know what we're for? That we are four people, we are for each other, we're four yeah. communities, we're four people of different races, different classes, different backgrounds. We are four people because Jesus was four people. Yeah. And so we have to grapple with these issues. And uh, yeah, anxiety is a huge issue for me. And it's not an issue that I'm through on. Um, I don't know how many times I've Googled symptoms of coronavirus. <laughs> and every time I have coughed and thought, oh, flipping heck, dying, I've got it, I've definitely got it. <laughs> and she's going, have you got this, have you got this? And I'm like, no, 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 you haven't got it. Um, because anxiety makes you feel like that, doesn't it? And, uh, and I was writing a chapter on anxiety, and I was, I, I was looking at all the technical books, you know, 
uh, one of the psychology books and the theologians, and, and they're really good. Um, but they didn't really say how anxiety felt. And uh, so I started reading blogs with normal people, <laughs> like you and like me. And uh, I came up with a bit of this. So I think this is what anxiety can feel like for some of us at the moment. Anxiety is your brain not being able to turn off. It's interesting when people say, oh, I don't have a mental health issue. I've never had mental health issues. I'm like, have you ever had a sleepless night? Yeah. Well, technically. <laughs> it's because your brain can't turn off. And uh, it's the unanswered text message that kills us inside. Especially WhatsApp, which you can tell it's been read. <laughs> it believes every negative scenario that you come up with. It's the inaccurate conclusions drawn as your mind takes off and you have no choice to follow its lead. It's really interesting at the moment, isn't it, how everyone's preempting everything. Have you noticed that? We're all trying to guess it, aren't we? Because that's what anxiety does. It's apologising for things that don't require you to say sorry. It's self-doubt and a lack of confidence to try and fix something that isn't a problem. It's a fear of failure and striving for perfection and beating yourself up when you don't get there. It tells you you're wrong, they don't like you. It's constantly asking the what if questions. And I think sometimes in church, you know, what we've done with people that struggle with anxiety is gone, you know, you just need to trust God a bit more. Uh, as if it's just, just like that. And you know, I've noticed we write on the silence and just meeting the most incredible people and people email. I mean, even the last couple of days, I was just reading a blog from someone who came to the Leeds show a couple of days ago. People are incredible. They are resilient. And uh, I realised that people struggle with anxiety actually. They're courageous, sensitive, caring, and incredible empathy. Really think of others. So anxiety isn't weakness. You know, Jesus suffered anxiety. Anxiety is not sin. Jesus was within, without sin, and yet he suffered anxiety in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I love this quote. Anxiety is a weakness. Live with anxiety, turning up and doing stuff with anxiety. It takes the strength most of us will never know. I love the definition in my books, and I was trying to find one on anxiety. And uh, it took me ages to find one I was happy with. But then I found this one, and I thought, I absolutely more than anything else, anxiety is scary. It's never wanted to hurt someone's feelings. It's never wanted to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the want and the need to be accepted and liked. So you try too hard sometimes. You try too hard sometimes. Who here maybe tries a little bit too hard sometimes? You know, um, my friends send me these cartoons. I quite like them as well. Here we go. This is anxiety. Some of us have just had it. What if nobody likes me? What if I taste weird? What if I'm too cold? What if I'm too hot? What if I'm just right and I can never live up to it again? <laughs> the pearls of overthinking, I don't know if you can relate to this one. When I'm saying, what do you think of me? Am I doing the right job? Am I doing the right job? Am, am I doing this wrong? Everyone is staring at me! Everyone is actually staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We've got to treat ourselves with a bit more compassion. There's a real book that helped me. It's called um, Clinical Depression, The Curse of the Strong. And the psychiatrist that wrote it said, nine times out of ten, he can tell the personal characteristics of someone that's struggling with depression. And they're these, not every time, but nine times out of ten, moral strength, reliability, diligence, strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, vulnerable to criticism, self-esteem dependent on the evaluation of others. People that struggle with this. Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill, Mother Teresa. Not weak people. And that's sort of people actually you quite like to be uh, your best friend. So I've come to the conclusion that depression, anxiety, panic attacks are not signs of weakness. They're signs of trying to remain strong for too long. And instead of going through a massive guilt trip at this time, and just trying to pull ourselves together, well, actually, maybe it's a time to try and work out what self-compassion is. I remember um, I spent most of my life looking great on the outside, but on the inside, feeling really, really down. I remember going up to my counsellor once, and I, you know, I was going through, and I pulled myself together. You know, I should be okay. I ought to be all right. And uh, she was like, actually, I think you just need to show yourself a little bit more self-compassion. I'm like, I said, I'm a bloke, and I do self-compassion, as we'll see. And I said, I'm not really into bubble baths and candles, you know what I mean? It's not really my scene. And she's like, 
I think the wrong idea of self-compassion is. Self-compassion and self-indulgence are two very different things. Self-indulgence, I just have that extra glass of wine just to take the edge off. And uh, I just have that extra cake. Um, um, you know, um, particularly at the moment, you know, self-isolating and all the stuff that's going on. Maybe they're the self-compassionate things. That's not self-compassion. Self-compassion is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. And uh, so Mike is one of my best friends, and me and Mike have worked together on and off for 25 years. And if Mike came up to me and was saying, Patrick, you know, the whole corona thing, Matt's quite anxious about it, and, uh, and it's affecting my family, my kids, my community, and all that sort of stuff, I would go, come on, Mike, you man up a little bit. You know what you need to do is just trust God a little bit more, you'll pray for him, you haven't been enough, have you? <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, you're a bit ugly as well, Mike, you know. I don't want to say that. Do you know what I, do I say that to every single day? Me. I'm constantly beating myself up, constantly telling you, because I stand on the stage and I talk to you lovely folk, I need to have my life 100% sorted. But I guess I'm realising that people connect to more of your scars than your success stories. People are longing for more for the reality than the show sometimes. And people want to go on a journey and want to go with people and just talk the destinations over there somewhere. And so we go together, we go grabbing each other's hands. And uh, the other thing um, I feel that like we really need to do better on is, 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 you know, at the moment, so many people's thoughts are just running wild, aren't they? And, uh, and if you haven't remembered anything that I've said tonight, and if you're watching online as well, please, please get this on. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> you know, sometimes preachers, we talk about a verse called taking captive every thought out of Corinthians. You've probably heard that verse. And a lot of times it's spoken about. It's like any time a thought comes into your mind that's a bit negative, you need to bash it in the name of Jesus with a Bible verse. And, uh, or, you know, if you're not a person of faith, you just need to win it away and just be positive. The reality is, I don't know if you, if you like me, I find the more I try not to think about something, what happens? The more you think about it, don't it? It's true. Let's have a go, shall we? Let's not think about chocolate right now. None of you, not one person in this room or watching online is allowed to think about chocolate. That was very nice. Last time I was doing this we had chocolate mousse actually, didn't we? That was very nice. I'm actually going to be distracted. Um, the thing is, some of you are concentrating, you're looking at me like, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. It's not a object, but anyway. Um, the reality is, Carl Young said this, whatever you resist, persists. My mate said this, and I know it's, it's quite a well known analogy, is um, if you imagine your thoughts as trains that come into a railway station, and uh, you can stand there on the railway platform and go, in the name of Jesus, train, you're not going to come in. It's going to come in. <laughs> and uh, but he says this, and you know, others have said it as well. Taking captive every thought is deciding whether you're going to get on the train or not. And actually, maybe when you're there, it's going, it, it, is that true? Is that what God says about me? Is that what my friends say about me? Is, is there reality in that? And taking captive every thought is when you're going, you know what, I'm not getting on that train. Is that train going to take me into a dark place? And if you do get on the train, guess what? Get off on the next stop if you can. Because you don't want to go into that dark place. And that's the thing. And that's actually a much more compassionate response of doing that. Um, in our Kintsugi group, my wife, um, she did a, a whole thing around self-acceptance. What we need to accept about the situation that we're in. And I guess I was thinking through, um, in the context of all the self-acceptance and acceptance and resignation being different things and, and grappling with that, and I thought, what are the things that I would love you guys to be able to accept from this talk? And I came up with a little bit of a list. So this is my prayer for you. I was praying before we started for all you guys here at Barnsley and all the people online. Please, please, accept the fact it's okay not to be okay. Accept the fact it's okay to have limitations. Life is never going to be perfect. You do not have to be all things to all people. Isn't that a relief? You can have questions. You don't have to agree with everybody. Some of you are very, very bad We support Arsenal. That is not a good thing to do. Anxiety is a weakness. 
struggling doesn't mean you're afraid of it, it means you're human being. You are loved no matter what. Listen to a different voice. And uh, so in the, um, I think it's week nine in the Kintsugi course, um, week nine is in self-acceptance, and uh, Diane showed this video um, that I'm going to show you now, and, uh, and I'll tell you how I reacted to it afterwards. Check this out. Hey, how are you? Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about how we're so freaking cruel to ourselves. If my house is super messy, I'm like, oh my gosh, you suck because you can't even keep a house clean. And I also was thinking about how the stuff I say to myself, like the hateful, mean stuff, I would never say to somebody else. I would never walk into your house when it's messy and say that. In fact, I wouldn't even think it. I feel like this is something that everybody does. Do you do that? How is it? What are some things that you say to yourself? Things that I probably beat myself up about more than anything else. Why didn't you clean the kitchen? If I cleaned the kitchen, why didn't I do the floor? Why didn't I? You know, what a pig, what a mess. Have you seen my kitchen today? <laughs> <laughs> like, if anyone's a pig, Mary. It looks like somebody lives here. What are some things that you say to yourself now? You're an exaggerating, selfish liar. Wow, that's harsh. <laughs> And to be honest, if I weigh it against the truth, it's not... Are you still saying to yes. You're never going to lose the weight. I know that's not true, but the more you tell yourself that, the I'm more you to... sort of believe it, and then you don't, you don't make that change when you probably could and should. I tell myself almost on a weekly basis, if not daily, I'm just not a good enough mother for my kids. But when you break it down, can you actually think of specifics in a way you're failing them? No. <laughs> but, I know, but we all do this. Like, we, we all have yeah. our own versions of it. Yeah. Holy crap. I, that is so mean. Yeah. Like, we're so cruel to ourselves. And you're right. I would never, ever say that to anybody else. Yeah. So, why would I say it to myself? The stuff you were saying that you say to yourself the most. I want you to say it to this girl. <laughs> Look at this girl. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> She's here. What happened? I want you to say it to this girl. Oh. oh, oh my god. Can you tell this girl that she's a pig and she's lazy? Uh, no, I really can't. She looks happy. I don't want to crush her. <laughs> You're saying it to this girl. You're literally saying it to this girl every day. Is it hard to say it to this, like, adorable, <laughs> little, cute, innocent girl? It is, especially when that, <laughs> when that picture reminds me of my daughter. What do you think that girl needs to hear? How would you encourage her? To just do your best. Just love. What would you want to say to yourself instead? You're enough. You're good. I would encourage her. I would say, you can do it. You're a good girl. And you do love people. And you're working every day to get better. And I can't look at her anymore because that, that's a great exercise. Well, what's your picture? <laughs> yeah, where's my picture? <laughs> yeah. I would tell this girl, wow. I would say your your opinion matters. Your talents matter. You're not inadequate. You don't have to change who you are in order for people to like you. I mean, obviously I knew I was going to talk to you. I knew I was going to show you the picture. But I actually hadn't looked at my own picture to do this. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? It's so, like, heart-wrenching because we're still that same person. And why, like, if we wouldn't say it to our younger self, if we wouldn't say it to our best, closest friend, why, like, why are we saying these mean things? Because I forgot who she was. You know what I mean? This makes me want to put this picture up somewhere. As a reminder. Yeah, and so when I start at the end of a long day beating myself up, you know, if I'm standing in front of the mirror, I'm like, oh, this and that. Maybe me to look at that girl and try to say it, and I don't think I could. I really don't think I could. She's cute. She's so cute. <laughs> so are you. Thank you. So cute. She does. She does. She does. She does. <laughs>
And so the next day, I was at my parents' house and I was walking upstairs and I saw this picture looking back. <laughs> Thank you, I'd be good. And uh, this was a classic. And God totally helped me, got me. And when you've got to stop doing that, you're not going to help yourself through this tough time if you keep doing that every five seconds. And uh, I know people have heard this talk a few times now and they've uh, actually taken photos of their younger selves and they've got the screensavers on their phone um, because it's a reminder, oh my goodness, I need to stop doing that. Because it becomes a habit, doesn't it? Um, it just becomes a natural way that we often react to something and then we've got to stop doing it. Um, many years ago now, I had uh, someone really, really amazing come and visit the project that I was working on. I had a visit from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Oh. Now, um, I've met lots of Prime Ministers in my time, normally a week before the election with 40 cameras. Uh, Desmond Tutu, there was none of that. And, and I was genuinely really excited about seeing him, introducing him to a lot of the young people that I was working with at the time. The problem was, none of the young people knew who he was. And uh, they did not have a clue why they had to get up early and meet this 81 year old bloke that he was at the time. And, uh, and I remember he sat there chatting to our young people and they were telling them about all the problems with life, crime and poverty and unemployment and um, violence in their community. And it was really, really good and I was really chuffed that he was listening to their pain and their trauma and their stories. And they sort of went on and on and he's still listening. And I sort of got to the point where I thought, like, you know, Desmond, this is all good, but now you can sock it to them. You know, really tell them where it's at. And he kept listening, and listening, and listening. And at the end of our time together, he turned to them. He went, you guys will remember one thing. Your past doesn't have to define your future. And then he grabbed a kid's hand. And I don't know about you, there's always one kid in your youth group where you think, please God, anyone else would like you to And he grabbed that kid's hand, and he looked at him. He went, I'll tell you what you are. You are a VSP, very special person. You are made in the image of God. You have the potential to change this world. And this kid, I don't know, I thought he was freaking out, he was looking at like, <laughs> And you know, it wasn't one of those miraculous stories, he suddenly got healed and everything was wonderful. He did get his hair cut for a while, he did stop smoking weed for a couple of days. Um, he got his CV sorted, he went down the estate going, there's no dude who to me. Um, but the reality was, is it was a moment. All the other kids didn't have a clue who he was. He still didn't have a clue. In fact, one of them at the end went, Ah, oh, it was really nice of Trevor MacDonald to come down and <laughs> hang out. Good old Trev. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Um, there was a point when me and Desmond Tutu were on our own. I wasn't for long. And I'll never forget, he said to me, Patrick, the one thing that you need to remember is this. You make God smile. And you know, I've told this story a lot. I've told it in front of 10,000 people at a big festival. And for years, when I used to tell the story, it's a bit longer, I've to give you the short version. Um, when I told it, I lied. You're thinking, I want a refund, I knew it. Um, I lied. I said to the thousands of people listening um, ex that he said, XLP, which is a charity I used to lead, make God smile. In fact, they saw people in their annual review, and uh, I'm sure they do. They're probably doing amazing stuff. But the reality was, he never said that. He said, I make God smile. Because I couldn't accept that I can make God smile. And you know, I think it's the same with you. You know, as we go through this time, the one thing I want you to take away is that you make God smile. You make God smile. When I was going through my tough time, my wife was like, you know what, I think you need to get out of the house a bit more, so I'm going to get you a dog. So here, she walked in the dog. <laughs> and uh, um, the dog misses me. In fact, it's the dog's birthday today. Uh, so we're all going to sing the number. That would be really weird. And, uh, but the dog is called Hope, which is a really rubbish name for a dog. Think about it. For the first six months, my neighbours, all they heard was me shouting out, no! Hope! <laughs> In fact, one day they heard me shout out, No hope! No hope! No hope! So I always have a really bad day today. I heard it five times. Finally, they heard me shout out and says, Diane, I've lost hope! <laughs> Jumped across the fence. 
And uh, what you've got to know is this. Hope is saying everything passes, nothing lasts forever. And you know, that's the thing to stick around on your social media. Not the doom and gloom we're hearing. It's going to be hard, we've got to accept the fact. But hope is saying everything passes, nothing lasts forever. Resilience is thriving in the midst of adversity. It's about keeping going. You know, I've been really inspired by the um, story of Corrie Ten Boom. Um, anyone remember Corrie Ten Boom? She wrote a book called The Hiding Place. It's an incredible book. And uh, it tells the story of in the Second World War, where basically um, they used to hide um, Jews in, uh, in, in, uh, behind a false wall. They built a false wall in Corrie's bedroom. And, uh, and it was incredible. And uh, eventually, her and her sister Betsy, they got caught and they got taken to Ravensburg concentration camp. And in Ravensburg concentration camp, the conditions were horrendous. They were, their, their hair and their bodies were being eaten by lice. And uh, it was just horrible. Uh, it was so horrible, in fact, the guards wouldn't go into some of the uh, places that they were sleeping. And, and, uh, but their attitude in the midst of adversity, their attitude of gratitude, they were grateful for some of the tough stuff because it kept the guards away. And, uh, and then there was this beautiful, beautiful moment um, where Corey says, at half four, they used to have to go out for roll call. And they stand there before the guards and humiliated, naked, cold. And she said, I remember once there was this woman, she just collapsed in front of her. And everyone looked down to try and drag her up. The guards looked mean and vicious. But then suddenly, uh, at half past four in the morning in the dark, they heard what they called the skylark. The skylark is one of the only birds that sings in the darkness as well as sings in the light. Just close your eyes for a second. I was like, when I heard that, you know what, God, I want to be the person that sings in the darkness as much as I sing in the light. I don't know if you've seen some of the videos going around on YouTube in Italy. Yeah. Um, you can't stop people singing, you know that? And you can't keep people down for too long. Because the human spirit knows that it's made to soar, it's made to flourish, it's made to be in communion with its God. And music is one of the beautiful things and the beautiful ways that it does that. So, just before um, I started Consuming Hope, I went to Amsterdam, me and Diane went, and uh, we went to Corrie Ten Boom's house, and uh, there's me standing in front of the hiding place, the wall, isn't it incredible? Um, tiny little place, and just thinking of the hundreds and hundreds of Jews um, that they saved. And sometimes at times like this, you know, it's really important to remember that we are part of a massive story of God doing stuff. You know, I'm conscious that um, just here in this community, uh, the history of Hudson Taylor, uh, the great missionary to China. I'm John Wesley. I stood on the steps of John Wesley and made Joel take a photograph of me uh, earlier. Great people that have gone before, but not only great people that have gone before. History, story. We find ourselves in a massive story of God's love invading the earth. When I was leaving um, Corrie Ten Boom's house, there's this beautiful woman. Um, she was a guide. And uh, she was telling us um, that Corrie Ten Boom finished all her talks by reading a poem. And, uh, and she held up this, um, this, and I was like, well, that's a mess. You know, what's Corrie Ten Boom is modern art before her time? What's all that about? And she started to read, my life is like a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours he weaves steadily. Over the time he weaves sorrow, and I in my foolish pride forget that he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shutter cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. With that, she turned the picture around. And it revealed this beautiful crown. The dark threads are needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. We have been looking at the back of the tapestry. And actually, God was creating a masterpiece. And I don't get it. I don't get it why light and shade need to go together sometimes. But I know that whatever we go through, that God weaves this stuff together. And though it feels like a complete mess and there's no hope, actually, He's creating a masterpiece. I don't believe that God actually causes some of the stuff that happens, but I believe that within it, actually, good can come out of all situations. 
And as hard as that is sometimes, hope is believing that everything passes, nothing lasts forever. So we've come to the end of our evening and uh, um, and the end of our Honestly Open Silence tour. And I don't know when we'll be able to do another one of these type of things. And uh, it's been really special, seriously, to share with you guys. Um, really special to share with people who I know watching online as well. And, uh, and I want to finish um, by reading a poem. Joe and Natasha are going to come back and help us. Um, I don't know what it is, but I seem to get on really well with old ladies. <laughs> I made a mistake in these saying I really like old ladies, and everyone laughed. And I was like, oh, that was funny. Um, I like them, they like me. Um, in fact, not old ladies, should I say more mature ladies? Um, ladies that can teach me a lot about wisdom. And uh, there's this lovely lady, I don't know if she's watching, but um, her name's Jane. And uh, Jane used to send me poems. She wrote them on typewriters and she sent them to me. And, uh, and she never heard me speak, but a number of years ago now, um, probably 18 months ago, uh, she managed to get out. She's got a very rare form of blood cancer. And um, she's a beautiful human being. And she got out to the place where I was sleeping, we got cushions so she was a bit more comfortable. And uh, she said, Patrick, I've written your poem. She started to give me hope. And I actually think these are some of the most beautiful words that um, I've ever been around. And uh, I'm going to finish by reading them to you this evening. If there's ever a poem that describes uh, what we're going through at the moment, I think it's this. Acceptance in the anguish. Beauty.
Father, we give you these things, Lord God. We come to the cross and we choose to let some of your stuff go. And uh, we know it's a process, but God, we long to live the next days, weeks, years in the shadow of your cross, Lord, knowing that you died for us, that you love us. That actually, because we know that you love us, that was the last choice accepting that. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Good night and God bless.